Well, Ayala Chakar is Professor of Law, Political Science, and Global Affairs, and Research Chair in Citizenship and Multiculturalism at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. Professor Shahar has received numerous excellence awards and has held research fellowships as a member of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, a distinguished visiting scholar at Princeton's Law and Public Affairs Program, and Emile Noel, Senior Fellow at NYU School of Law, and the W.M. Keck Fellow in Legal Ethics and Professional Culture at Yale Law School. She's published and lectured widely on citizenship theory, immigration law, multiculturalism, cultural diversity and women's rights, family law and religion in comparative perspective, transnational legal ethics, highly skilled migration and global inequality. Shahar is the author of Multicultural Jurisdictions, Cultural Differences and Women's Rights from Cambridge in 2001, which which was the winner of the, of the APSA's 2002 Foundations of Political Theory Section Best First Book Award. Beyond receiving wide scholarly recognition, this award-winning work has also proven influential in the real world, intervening in actual public policy and legislative debates in Canada and abroad. It was cited most recently by England's Archbishop of Canterbury, who described Shachar's work as, quote, highly original and significant, end quote. Ontario's Ministry of the Attorney General as well also cited it, and the Supreme Court of Canada. Wow. Her most recent book is The Birthright Lottery, Citizenship and Global Inequality from Harvard University Press in 2009, named the 2010 International Ethics Notable Book in recognition of its superior scholarship, and contribution to the field of international ethics. Um, Ayelet's talk is entitled Entangled, Gender, Religion, and Human Rights. Thanks so much for coming. Good afternoon. Oh, it works. <laughs> Bonjour. Buenos dias, shalom, assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, Carol, for this very generous introduction. It's a pleasure for me uh, to be here, especially uh, with my dear friend and colleague, Sheila bin Khabib. So it's really a wonderful opportunity. And I want to thank the rest of the organizing committee and the students and the Mellon Fellows and everyone else who was involved in uh, getting me here. So it's a real uh, pleasure to be with you and also the brave souls for being here at this uh, late afternoon hour. Before I turn to my presentation, I have to get a sense of the room. So I just, if you don't mind, if, could you let me know how many people say are from philosophy? All right, <laughs> political science. Law? Oh, good. I'm not the only one. Um, anything else? Anyone else that I missed? Oh, political theory. Great. Anthropology, right? <laughs> All right. Good. So we have a wonderful multidisciplinary audience, which is very good for our uh, discussion uh, this afternoon. And uh, in terms of my, the title of my talk, as you heard, it's uh, Entangled. And I'll explain later on why I think uh, gender, religion, and human rights indeed are uh, quite deeply entangled. And uh, not only that, I'm going to suggest that given that they are entangled in the experience, the social experience of individuals, uh, we should also try and mirror that in the kind of legal institutional ideas uh, that we have. Um, so given that Shayla has given such a beautiful uh, lecture and also has sold up the legal uh, utopian uh, version of, of, of law, I don't know if I fit in that. I think Shayla is actually now the most utopian among uh, the people who believe in law, so we'll have to see whether you find uh, my work legal utopian, but I take that as a compliment if that is if, if it would fit within that uh, trajectory. Now, in in the interest of time, let me just uh, tell you how I want to divide my talk. I'll divide it into three parts. The first part, uh, I want to distinguish at the theoretical level between two kinds of diversity uh, claims, um, which might be raised by members of minority communities. And when I talk about minority communities, I'm thinking about religious, ethnic, racial, indigenous uh, communities, linguistic communities, but my focus will be mostly primarily on religious communities with one exception, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit also about customary law in South Africa, if not, ask me during the Q&A. Um, so I'm thinking about the relationship between minorities, these religious minorities, and the states in which uh, they have settled, in which they reside, and just in the uh, geopolitical space that I'm thinking about, 
all the states that I will talk about are states which are constitutionally, they're constitutional democracies, and they're also committed to, to the separation of state uh, from religion. As you know, there are many countries in the world which do not follow that separation, but for the purposes of our discussion, I'll just focus on those, and you'll see partly some of the tensions arise precisely because of the notion of a strict separation, and I'll uh, partly uh, explore some of these boundaries and whether we need uh, to rethink them. So the first kind of diversity inclusion, uh, the diversity claim that I will uh, refer to, I'll call the fair inclusion claim. That's probably the familiar claim that when you're thinking about multicultural citizenship, for example, you probably have in the back of your mind. So this is the ability of minorities to be included in public spaces, by which I mean schools, workplaces, official buildings, parks, buses, subways, shopping malls, and the like. And I want to contrast this more familiar claim, uh, the claim for fair inclusion, one which, by the way, I would include the various um, hijab debates that Shayla has described. I would place under this fair, first dimension or first heading with diversity claims that is a uh, fair uh, inclusion. And I want to suggest to you that there's another, and I want to suggest far more difficult uh, complicated challenge on the horizon, again, within these contexts of uh, claims raised by my minority communities. And I will label this uh, second kind of claim as falling under the umbrella of privatized or enclave diversity. And just to give you a hint, I'll talk about this later on, but here when I speak about these uh, kinds of claims, I'm tracking or trying to identify uh, partly what more religious uh, elements within religious minority communities are now uh, seeking or trying to encourage, if not in certain cases, um, indirectly coerce some of their members into um, moving away from engagement with the secular state and its uh, juristic institutions such as public courts and really seeking uh, a new form of insulation and immunization from both constitutional norms and international human rights uh, standards, and in effect asking their community members uh, to take the route of private ordering. So this, in a way, um, is a whole new discourse, and in many ways I want to suggest to you that it's quite disturbing, because part of the notion that Shayla, again, has so nicely uh, elucidated, the notion of iterations either occurring at the legal or the democratic sphere, in order for these to occur, they have to occur in public spaces. And part of the concern that I have is that many of the harshest or the most significant debates now about diversity are occurring uh, under the umbrella of privatized diversity, which as I said, I'll explain later on more specifically what I mean by that. And I want to suggest that as a principled matter, the claims of fair inclusion, the first kind of claims, when these uh, come to the public uh, um, sphere, that there are strong justifications uh, for adopting a generous interpretation or a generous interpretive regime if we're getting to courts, uh, that it should be open to accepting these kinds of claims. Again, not without limitations. That is typically when we think about any kind of right, religious freedom, gender equality, um, any kind of right in a constitutional order which is not hierarchical, typically these rights limit each other. So there's a stretch, you can expand a right, but it would be limited once it hits another right or it endangers another constitutional value or human rights protection, or in certain cases, just in the legal terminology, if there's a compelling state interest, that might again trump some kind of a protection of a right, but it doesn't mean that you're not treating the right seriously, you're stretching it as much as you can with the possibility possibility of having some kinds of restrictions and some constitutions such as the Canadian and the South African and the Israeli have within them the built-in kind of limitations. And other courts just do it uh, through their own interpretive uh, kind of work. And I want to suggest that if uh, fair inclusion should be interpreted as generously as possible, I want to suggest exactly the mirror image for the second kind of claim, the privatized diversity set of claims. I don't think they should be rejected uh, just offhand. There should be some kind of a discussion, but the basic presumption should be reversed. That is, the interpretation should be as narrow as possible. And again, I'll explain why I think that is uh, the case. And in identifying these two kinds of claims, and more specifically their relevance or their implications for gender equality and human rights, I want to suggest that we're really faced with a much larger puzzle and that I want you to keep in the back of your minds. That is the question of what might the new engagement or really set of engagements between state and religion in the 21st century 
look like? And to a great extent, and I think, again, this comes through very powerfully in Shayla's work and others in the room, people who have thought about the interaction between secularism and religiosity, it seems like the models that uh, we currently have are not fully satisfactory. And indeed, there is resistance to them on many uh, layers and many uh, different uh, kinds of agents are resisting them. So the question is, if we are going to have a new kind of interaction, how might it look? And the second question which I want to raise, and again, this is uh, pushing the envelope somewhat, is asking whether if we have this new kind of arrangement or set of arrangements between state and religion in the 21st century or early 21st century, would it be possible to find a path to accommodate diversity with equality? And that's really the core challenge uh, that I uh, have been working on and I'm thinking through. And uh, to some extent, I want to suggest that there are some optimistic signs, some very negative ones, but I want to suggest that at least as, as a principled uh, vision looking forward, it would be quite terrific if we were able to accommodate diversity with equality. Then we would get all the values of religious diversity, say, and, and the examples that I will use, as well as some greater voice and protection for women's rights within uh, religious minority uh, communities. And indeed, I want to suggest to you that some of the most complex challenges that we're seeing uh, today um, often are referred to, at least in the legal terminology, we'll, we'll refer to them as multiple uh, or conflicting claims, meaning, and I'll just give you a few examples, that we're, done, we're hardly ever dealing anymore with just one single value that is to be protected. That is, you can think about various examples of gender equality potentially conflicting or standing in tension with uh, religious diversity. Uh, you could think about sexual orientation uh, and freedom of association. Again, we have many cases where the two uh, stand in conflict with one another. Uh, uh, we have examples which are now filtering uh, through the courts, which deal not just with the general question of either the hijab, the headscarf, or the niqab, which is the face cover, but cases which the conflicts are, again, they become um, more multi-layered. That is, I'm thinking about an example of a case of a woman who is a key witness in a criminal case, and she is covered, she has the niqab. Now, for anyone who knows anything about criminal law, what every uh, criminal defense lawyer would tell you is that they want to see the facial demeanor of the person, especially when they're doing cross-investigation. So should that be a moment where even if you have a very strong uh, protection of religious uh, freedom, that might be a moment where you might say, we need to find some exemptions or some kind of, of modification because there's a competing interest of a fair trial. So all of these kinds of competing claims are, are the ones uh, that I have in the back of my mind. If you want to think about the US context, one of the most significant decisions in the last, uh, that uh, the Supreme Court gave in its uh, last um, a session was the one that dealt with the conflict or the tension between employment, federal employment anti-discrimination laws uh, versus the degree of institutional autonomy that ought to be given to a church or a ministry that's referred to as the ministerial exception or exemption case. Really complicated case. I'm happy to talk about it uh, later on. I personally think it was not uh, that the decision was not the most balanced one. But again, this is one of these kinds of claims. You have a strong federal protection for a workplace, in that particular case, the Americans Disability Act, versus the right of a ministry or a church uh, to have its own uh, internal order uh, relatively uh, self-contained and, and not regulated by any external forces. So these are the kinds of, of, of questions which arise. And indeed, not only is this sufficiently or enough uh, of, of, uh, of, of material for us to work with. I want to suggest that the real, real, real interesting cases are the ones where you have the same plaintiff or the same party really raising two kinds of claims. That is saying that their claim itself is intersecting. That is, a woman might be bringing a case, and you can actually think about their religious freedom cases in that sense, also the hijab cases, as raising a claim for religious freedom, which is also a claim for gender equality. That is, both principles might be motivating the same kind of uh, demand or, or request for either recognition, accommodation, exemption. So these are really, in a way, the brave new world in which we live. And I want to suggest to you, first of all, that it's fascinating. Second, that it's actually quite different difficult to address. So in terms of the approaches that we have seen, I'll just, I, I'll just place uh, my approach before I go into any details. I want to suggest to you that a lot of the kind of uh, jurisprudential um, preferences or exhibited preferences that we find, at least in the U.S. Supreme Court, so going back actually to the question that was raised earlier, uh, to some extent the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court and many uh, justices throughout the, the US legal system and also legal academia have taken a very strong preference for a winner-takes-all approach, which, and it's a doctrinal approach. That is, it means that um, 
one side will win and one side will lose. And you can see once we're talking about these intersecting or these multi-layered kinds of claims, this means that you have to make a very difficult choice. And I want to suggest to you that beyond the US, there's actually a tremendously rich experience now with what's referred to as the world of new constitutionalism, where this winner takes all methodological conception is actually rejected. That is, there's a, a, a serious attempt to try and find more uh, flexibility, to try and find more context-sensitive kind of responses. And by doing this, the attempt is to find uh, what are referred to as balancing mechanisms, proportionality is one example of that. And really, these open a whole new way to address these kinds of uh, conflicting claims. And in part, what I'll present later on is a more institutional model, which I would call regulated interaction, fits within this more uh, flexible kind of an approach trying to really recognize not just one value, but if possible, two or three, depending on what's the competition. So what I'll do in the second part of my talk, I'll quickly sketch one such approach, which I'll refer to as regulated interaction. And again, I just want to try um, to work through both the principles and the institutional dimension, that is to try and challenge the very assumption that by granting consideration, say, to uh, religious diversity and uh, gender equality, I want to challenge the assumption that we can't do both uh, together and that we inevitably are forced to choose one over another. As I said, that's the winner-take-all kind of a mentality, and I want to try and challenge that. It's not an easy challenge, but I think it's one that's worth uh, pursuing. And part of what I'll do, just as a concrete example, I'll talk a little bit about family law, just because this is a casebook illustration now to many of these uh, really broiling and, and complicated challenges that we're seeing in the sense of the intersection of gender equality and religious diversity uh, in many parts of the world. And again, given that I want to find uh, these alternative models, I will suggest that instead of an either your rights or your culture kind of a solution or predicament, uh, I want to place uh, women, religious women, at the center of the analysis. And I'm thinking about them as citizens, as mothers, social and political activists, human rights bearers, dreamers, members of the faith. You can add whichever one uh, uh, you want, but uh, just really just to mention some of their multiple responsibilities and affiliations. And I want to say that if we actually place these agents at the center of our analysis, then the picture really shifts. It's, for example, the winner takes all uh, approach just doesn't work for them because the kinds of claims or difficulties that they have really occur because of these intersecting commit commitments that they might have to their faith and to their uh, claims for greater equality. Uh, within the faith to uh, a demand or, or hope that their religious minority community itself would be included within the wider sphere. So by definition, their claims are multiple. And inevitably, if we deal with these issues, we also have to deal with a side issue, or some would say a very central issue, which is the question of who speaks for a culture, what happens if there are multiple voices. And once these kinds of debates or discussions reach the courts, what are the courts to do if there are multiple interpretations? Should they ever intervene in these kinds of debates? And if so, how? And again, if we'll have time, I'll speak about that. If not, ask me during the Q&A. And third and finally, if we have some time, I'll just give you some examples, not just family law, education, uh, succession of political power, contracts. There are many, many fields of law where these kinds of intersections do occur. So that's our plan, and all of that will be done in... 35 minutes, or so I hope. Okay, so let me just first uh, go back to the distinction between the two kinds of claims, uh, just really to make sure that we're all on the same uh, page. So the claim for fair inclusion, I'm assuming, is relatively familiar in the room. I'll just give you one concrete legal example, a recent one. It just really nicely illustrates the notion of fair inclusion. So this is a case which uh, came before the Supreme Court of Canada in 2006. It's called Multani. And it's a case in which uh, a young Sikh student, uh, he was a new immigrant to Canada, uh, came to Canada, uh, settled with his family in Quebec, and he came to school and he was carrying uh, the kirpan. It's a small ceremonial dagger, uh, which for believers is seen as one of the five Ks, the five main things that you have to follow uh, as part of the Sikh uh, faith. And he came to school with this kirpan, and it's actually underneath one's clothes, so no one knew about it, but one afternoon, that dagger fell, and it fell, and everyone saw it in the, play in the playground. And the school that he went to had a very strict uh, policy, which said no kinds of weapons or dangerous objects are permitted in the school. And then the question became, is this kirpan, is this small dagger, is this potentially a weapon? Or is this a religious symbol? And this is pretty much what the whole debate was about. There were expert witnesses which were brought in. Everyone talked about it, and they were trying to understand uh, well, how to interpret this kind of, a, of, 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 again, an object. The school said it's a dangerous weapon. That was their claim. And um, the 
other parties, which were the student, his parents, the members of the Sikh community, which were interveners, they said that it's an important, they classified the dagger as an important religious symbol and therefore one which uh, should, the child should be permitted to carry to school. So this was the debate. It went on, came all the way out to the Supreme Court of Canada. The Sikh uh, child, that is the student, uh, failed in all uh, lower courts, but when the case uh, came to the Supreme Court of Canada after hearing uh, the evidence, the court actually ruled in favor of the student. And I want to tell you why I want you to hear the reasons, because they're really quite fascinating. And their argument was that holding the decision to ban the coupon uh, was not the least drastic means. That is, you can think about different ways in which the state, or in that particular case, the province of Quebec could have responded. This was not the least drastic means to address the potential harm. So they didn't deny the fact that there was a potential harm, just their response. Um, um, and they weighed it, they had to weigh the sincerity of the uh, belief of this particular student, which was seen as sincere, and also the fact that the state's interference, the ban, was not trivial. So these are the kinds of considerations that courts are permitted to do, and then they held in favor of Multani, the student. But I want you to hear the court's words, not my uh, description of it, and here it is. The court said the following, the argument that the wearing of the coupons should be prohibited because the coupon is a symbol of violence and because it sends the message of using uh, that using force is necessary to assert rights and resolve conflict must fail. So so this was the school's argument. Not only is this assertion contradicted by the evidence regarding the symbolic nature of the kirpan, it is also disrespectful, disrespectful, this is a powerful word from a court, disrespectful to believers in the Sikh religion and does not take into account constitutional values based on multiculturalism. Now granted, this is Canada, so. <laughs> It's quite a different discourse from what Shayla described, right, in terms of the European courts and even the European courts of human rights. This is a majority decision, and indeed some of the most distinguished uh, judges that we have in our court uh, fully agreed uh, with it. So just one description or one strong illustration of the claim uh, for fair inclusion. Now what cases like Multani uh, do is they permit inclusion in the public sphere uh, or those who seek inclusion, fair inclusion in the public sphere an opportunity to do so but without necessarily losing identity-based markers that they see as significant, right? So it could be religious-based, cultural-based, group-based, but definitely the, the notion here is that you can uh, come to the public sphere, be a full member in the public sphere, but without having to lose something that's very central to how you conceive your own identity. And just if you want to think about this, um, if you think about it in the words of Iris Young, for example, she would say it's a heterogeneous public in which persons stand forth with their differences acknowledged and respected. And again, this is acknowledged knowledge and respected in our encounters as citizens and shared political space. So, so this is really the fair inclusion line. As I said, it's a more familiar one. And the only thing that I want to point out is that if fully accepted, uh, clearly this is not a trivial claim. That is, it does have the potential uh, to make the public sphere different, right? It would be less uniform. It will be more pluralistic. And arguably, this is precisely the reason why we are seeing some of the resistance even to this uh, more minimal claim, the claim for fair inclusion. And again, especially the European countries are, are, are clearly uh, resisting these kinds of fair inclusion uh, claims now. And I want to suggest that in part, um, it might be the reinterpretation by some members of the majority community that this is actually not a trivial claim. <laughs> that this is not a trivial claim. That is, um, that what it might challenge is the claim or the cultural kinds of claims that the majority could raise, right? It would be their collective histories, identities, perhaps even privileges uh, that might be reduced or challenged through this enlarged and more diverse vision of the public sphere. So partly I would read, say, the hijab cases as falling into that kind of a response, right? The political response of, of majorities actually saying, we have our own culture too, it's not just a minority's claim. I actually see that as a very, very dangerous uh, turn because if the arguments that are raised in favor of cultural uh, recognition for minorities are turned around and reappropriated by the majorities, this could be a very, very unpleasant kind of scenario uh, for minorities and I fear that for example if we get uh, if we get the cases the, the current niqab bans the face covering bans if they go all the way up to the European Court of Human Rights I'm not at all sure that they would not accept some kind of a cultural majoritarian claim saying this is France this is Belgium this is who we are and I think that would be just a very dangerous precedent and given that the court in Laozi, which is the case of the crucifix uh, in, in Italy we can talk about that later on uh, the, the court actually accepted a very uh, um, creative theory of, of what crucifix can stand for, which Italy said they were universal and inclusive, so who knows what they might do with, <laughs> with these claims of culture. So, 
just to say, all of these debates, the fair inclusion debates, are deeply textual, and they're, deep, they're, they're textured, and they're rich, and they're multilayered, and they're complicated. So if this is not complicated enough, I want to suggest that there is this new uh, challenge that we're facing, and it's on the horizon. And that's the privatized diversity, or the enclave diversity uh, kind of claim. And there are different manifestations of this challenge. The way in which I want to phrase it to you, or the, the, the example that I will use, is when we're seeing self-proclaimed uh, guardians of the faith, again, I'm talking just about religious minority communities, um, seeking to establish or encourage, um, gently or not, members of the minority uh, community to turn to private arbitration tribunals. These are non-state institutions. They're not public courts. and uh, these are institutions which are legal in most, at least in most common law countries. Uh, you can enter them through a contractual agreement, a consensual agreement between two parties. You write a contract which says that now you're turning to arbitration and whatever the arbitrator decides becomes binding. This is actually occurring all the time for sure in New York City, but in any other part of the world as well. This is a very standard procedure now. So if you want your sort of law 101 or 102 kind of uh, 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 moment, each and every you know one of you could actually become an arbitrator. There's no requirement of legal knowledge, there's no requirement of legal training. As I said, it's fully based on the idea of individual autonomy and consent. If the two parties consent and turn to any one of you as the third party who will be their arbitrator and a contract is held to be valid, then not only is your decision uh, standing as a final and binding decision, it will also be enforced through our civil court system. So this is a whole just development of, 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 of switch or change that we're seeing in our law, irrespective of religious claims, just a rise of privatized uh, kinds of dispute resolution. But my concern is that once this institutional option is available, you can imagine the kinds of concern that might arise if we actually add concerns about power and equities, if we add a possible coercion that occurs within uh, religious communities, or just, again, uh, various ways of encouraging parties uh, to turn uh, to these uh, kinds of alternative institutions. And as I said, they are, uh, on the face of it, uh, they are legal and permitted. So this is partly the reason why this is such a serious challenge, because the way in which at least some proponents of these privatized tribunals are raising them is precisely in order to avoid or shield uh, the decisions of these tribunals uh, from constitutional challenges or from uh, the application of international human rights or standards. So this is uh, quite a serious way of, of really bringing to the four claims of uh, hands-off approach or non-interventionist uh, set of claims vis-a-vis -vis the state, which could never pass if this were uh, had to go through the standard uh, process of primary legislation, for example. No chance that it would pass, say, in Canada uh, or in other countries uh, in this country. However, we are seeing this occurring in a way through the back door, and that's why I want to refer to it as a back door, because if this had been debated uh, under uh, standard uh, kinds of legislation procedures or democratic procedures that we have, it probably wouldn't have not passed, but it is occurring on the ground. And I want to suggest that it's a real... Uh, storm to come. That is, we have to address it, and I'll just uh, give you some examples or indications to why I think it's so central. It's central because it brings three contested kinds of tensions and claims that we have in our societies. Obviously, claims of uh, religion, religious freedom, claims of gender equality, and it's also that just the rise of private justice is deeply connected to the rise of the neoliberal state. It's just uh, these all these things are deeply interconnected. And if you just want to have concrete examples, we had a very acrimonious debate in Canada, which really followed precisely the lines of what I've described to you, a more conservative uh, Muslim religious uh, group, a more conservative, self-defined um, conservative group, which wanted to create one of these tribunals called the Dar al-Qaeda. It was a big public debate. At the end of the day, despite the fact that normally you could actually turn to such uh, a tribunal, because this became such a political debate, um, the legislation was changed, and now we have a prohibition. You cannot turn to such to such um, parties, third parties, to arbitrate your debate if it's a family law dispute. So it's a very specific prohibition, which applies to all religions, not just uh, to Islam. It applies across the board. So even if there was uh, previously a Beth Din, a Jewish Beth Din, it can no longer operate as a binding institution. I'll tell you later on, it's, you can actually still have these uh, contracts going on, and they're mediated, which, unless you know a lot about the law, means that the state would not enforce it. But the chance that someone who actually had an agreement signed and perhaps had, had their imam or rabbi sign it, and that, the assumption that they would know that is, is really quite a stretch. I mean, I teach one of my courses in my law school. I teach a, a course in professionalism and ethics, and I always ask my students a question about mediation and arbitration, and they're smart kids, and they always fail it because it's so difficult, even if you have the legal knowledge. So assuming that someone who doesn't know would have the ability to 
really have these very fine uh, legal skills to know whether or not it's binding is, I think, a bit of a stretch. Now, just in the sense of where this is also occurring, uh, Carol mentioned uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Actually, and he had, a, I think, a beautiful speech, not because he mentioned my work, but because it's actually a very sophisticated, nuanced um, elaboration of his vision of what might be the relationship between uh, religious law and secular law in England. But one of the things which he uh, proposed or he raised was the option of thinking about non-state kind of uh, tribunals, uh, which would apply potentially um, some version of Sharia law, and I don't like that expression because it's actually extremely hard uh, to use a definition of what Sharia stands for. Uh, but his vision or what was picked up from that particular lecture was this notion of saying perhaps we will have these kinds of institutions in England. And you remember there was criticism from right, left, center, pretty much the whole political array. So that's one concrete example. In the US, there's actually a very strange manifestation of this kind of debate, which is occurring negatively. That is, some states are proactively, I think uh, Aziz al Hibri mentioned this, are proactive legislating against the use of uh, either Islamic law or interestingly enough international law as well so they have this combination <laughs> these are the two big dangers that we're facing or presumably this uh, country is facing so just to give you a sense these are very real live debates and in a way it's very good that they're live debates because the concern with precisely this kind of a procedure is precisely the fact that it's actually hidden you don't actually see it so it's in a way I'm very pleased that these are public debates because then at least we can have a conversation about it so I've given you hopefully uh, enough information about uh, these kinds of procedures. You're welcome to ask me a little bit more about it during the Q&A, but I want you to, um, hopefully, um, I've convinced you that there's a real danger here, that this presumably just procedural technical change of moving the discussion from the public court to these private uh, institutions uh, is not just a, a, a trivial kind of a move. It's actually deeply dangerous. It, it could rewrite or reshape the relationship between state and religion, again, in states which officially do not permit uh, religious law to have uh, any binding kind of status. And I want to suggest that it is something that we should uh, seriously think about. Now, in terms of criticizing the privatized diversity claim, I think the easiest uh, route to take is just to suggest that the, uh, the weakest link of this type of an argument is to suggest that some institutions or some communities should have unfettered power, they should be free from any kind of constitutional or international regulation. And even if we accept the argument uh, for non-intervention on grounds of allowing associational freedom, for example, uh, allowing associational communities as much freedom as possible to pursue their own vision of the good in a diverse society, this commitment in and of itself uh, is not unlimited, that is, it, does, it, it doesn't uh, make the argument, that is, you can say that even if uh, there's a strong argument of religious liberty, religious liberty, as I've already mentioned earlier on, itself has certain limits in constitutional democracies. It could be restricted by other liberties, by other rights, by other uh, claim holders. So even if you claim that you have associational freedom, that doesn't do enough of uh, the work. And I also want to suggest that given that we live in a world where there's so much uh, interaction among different legal system. Thus, the notion of, having, of, of suggesting that you could just have an island of jurisdiction which is absolutely unaffected by anything else in and of itself is, is not just unrealistic, it's also unconvincing and I want to say normatively unattractive. That is no state as an island. States themselves now, and we heard from Shayla, themselves are subject to various layers in, of regulation which uh, occur sometimes with their consent, sometimes without their consent, right? If, if states consent to a particular agreement, that's not a problem, but we sometimes even have uh, some transnational norms which would be binding even if you've not consented to them. So this applies to states which we take their sovereignty and their self-determination to be quite serious. So in such a world it would be just inconsistent to suggest that then minority communities can come and say we can have this unbelievably strong kind of a protection uh, just by virtue of us wishing uh, to do so. So it's a much more complicated uh, world in which we live and we have these intersecting and these competing in some, certain cases overlapping in certain cases indeed conflicting sources of law and authority and identity. They could be at the most uh, subnational level, national, regional, international, and we're seeing all of these interactions occurring. So it, it's just in such a world, it's an incredible claim to suggest that all of a sudden we need to um, just ignore all of these issues and create, artificially create now, a very clean kind of Mondrian-like uh, clean, very clear lines. Here is the yellow, here is the red, here is the white. We just don't live in that kind of a world. It's much more uh, intersecting now. Um, and I want to suggest that the real challenge that this raises then for constitutional democracies is 
not just to necessarily jump to a conclusion which perhaps some of you are thinking, which is just to say, do what Canada did, just ban, just say this is not permitted, period. I'll, I'll come in a minute to the reasons why I think this is not necessarily the best kind of a route uh, as a practical uh, matter. But still, we're left with the challenge of um, defining how much room, uh, what kind of degree um, of accommodation or exemption ought to be given in pluralistic uh, societies. So the fact that we have these multiple layers or sources of authority still doesn't give us an answer of what's, what's the right uh, kind of balance that we have to draw uh, between uh, these competing claims. And that indeed is really uh, the kind of challenge that we're facing today. So just going back to the privatized diversity uh, debate that I've mentioned to you, Clearly, hopefully, you're convinced that I'm not too sympathetic to this line of argument, at least in its extreme articulation. It's a claim for exclusion. And even if it's a claim for self-exclusion, it doesn't make it more uh, legitimate. Um, so I think it would be the kind of automatic response or, or the kind of, in a way, a logical response is to say, well, we'll just prohibit this kind of an action. We'll prohibit it because uh, there are so many policy considerations to suggest that it's potentially... Uh, potentially uh, injurious to some group members and particularly to more vulnerable group members. If you're thinking about family law, all your concerns about gender equality would be heightened and exaggerated and, and inflated in a way in this kind of a forum. So there are good arguments to suggest that perhaps this is not a legitimate route. But then I want to suggest to you that just the notion of, of simply imposing a legal ban or saying that we're going to, we here speaking as a state or a regional entity, to say this is not uh, permitted, private ordering, say, in family matters is not permitted, um, would just not make these issues disappear. All that it would do is would just push them underground. So this would, you would have precisely the same kinds of, uh, not precisely the same kind, we actually don't know what the empirical evidence is. That is, we can assume that at least some members, precisely the members who are more coerced to turn to these religious institutions, alternative, alternative dispute resolution institutions in the first place, would continue to be um, pressured to turn to now these unauthorized, unregular, unregularized, in a way invisible institutions, which do exist but are not registered uh, in any kind of public uh, public uh, discourse or indeed in any kind of public document. And I want to suggest that if we do that, we might really be uh, placing at a more vulnerable position precisely those individuals which really might need the constitutional protections that we have or the international human rights uh, kinds of remedies that we have. They're not perfect, but they're definitely better than not having anything at all. And I want to suggest that especially uh, female members of very uh, juristic-centered religions, and as it happens, um, in, in, uh, just in the context of our discussion, say if, if we are thinking about the UK or, or Canada and the US, um, Judaism and Islam are deeply juristic or deeply legalistic kinds of uh, communities. So I want to suggest that um, women who belong to these communities, if they continue to turn to now these absolutely unauthorized, unregularized, as I said, invisible kinds of institutions, they might be hit uh, particularly hard because it would be very hard for them to fend for themselves if they have the courage or the ability to even challenge one of these decisions, uh, their ability to do so would be uh, really limited because none of this is occurring as part of what we know as our formal law. So given that I don't think that the standard secular systems response, which is either to legislate away uh, these privatized diversity challenges or simply to ignore the problem, that is, that's another solution. This is what the UK is doing. The UK is actually the country that has the most established uh, Sharia councils, as they are called in the UK, unofficial bodies of decision making, uh, which are not recognized, but clearly everyone knows that they are in existence, and indeed a growing number of women are turning to them. So this is really a, 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 a quite an interesting story which we could look into later on. But just the idea of either uh, ignoring these kinds of um, practices or legislating them away, I want to suggest to you that at the perhaps at the symbolic level they might have a value, but if we're worried about uh, the protection of more vulnerable members, they might uh, not do the job. And in fact, they might have exactly the opposite uh, um, kind of uh, an effect of, of disempowering precisely these women, these women who need more protections and, and re reinforcing their uh, vulnerability. And all of this is done in the name of protecting their rights. So it's, it's a serious uh, concern 
uh, that we have. And again, just looking uh, specifically at Judaism and Islam, so the way in which this could occur as a practical matter if we're thinking about family law, you would have uh, a woman uh, who married, entered uh, her marriage uh, through the religious route, which in most countries, if you enter the religious route, it's actually also recognized as a civil marriage. So you would have both a civil status, a religious status. All that the state can do is terminate the civil status, assuming that there's a breakdown in the relationship, but you would still need to get the get from a religious institution if you're looking for, um, if you want to uh, get the release from uh, an Islamic marriage, you would need uh, probably if your husband is refusing, you'll have to use the khula kind of procedure. So these are real complicated issues which only religious institutions can provide because remember, we're talking about states which officially are divorced from religion. They can't provide these kinds of remedies. So this is why these are complicated issues. There are also financial matters if you're thinking about the maher, should it, not, should it or should it not be uh, permitted to be enforced. And I want to suggest that if we want to grant the same freedoms that we grant all other women in a society, that is the ability to break up their families or to uh, enter a new relationship or uh, any of these kinds of protections that women have uh, should apply across the board, including uh, and should affect also members of religious minority communities. And separating, just treating these two as occurring on totally different spheres is not the best way necessarily of addressing their claims. So, how am I doing with time? Five minutes. Okay, so I'll have to tell you all of my responses in five minutes. This would be very telegraphic. So I want to suggest that if we want to try and find ways to accommodate diversity with equality, as I suggested earlier on, and if we want to include as many players as we can, the individual, the community, the state, regional, transnational, all these uh, kinds of players should be in the mix. Uh, again, trying to recognize women as religious members as well as, as, as holding these intersecting and potentially conflicting affiliations to both identity and norm creating um, traditions, then we have to think creatively. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'll really, as I said, I'll do this telegraphically. So there are different kinds of ways of thinking about this. The first and the easiest one in a way is to think about potentials for change within the community. Uh, I'm a big believer in that. Um, so you could think about uh, women having access to the sacred texts of a particular tradition, which they have historically never had. And through that uh, kind of reinterpretive work, uh, really just uh, find or reveal or create um, more gender friendly or human rights friendly or enforcing kinds of interpretations in these traditions. It's as absolutely possible, at least in these very legalistic traditions. They just have such a variety of tools of interpretation. The only trick would be that you really have to be familiar with the hermeneutical type of moves that you're permitted to make. So you would have to be credible internally in terms of the work that you do. But there's no reason to assume that if you have access to these sources of knowledge that you shouldn't be able to do that. So that's an internal kind of a solution, which is in many ways, I'm optimistic about it. It is already occurring on the ground. The only issue with it is that's a very, very long-term kind of a solution. And the question is, do we just want to wait or do we want to do something in the intermediate kind of a period? Um, but I think it is a, a quite um, an optimistic, or at least that's one source of optimism. I also want to suggest to you that some countries are... Um, even engaging in a process which tries to motivate these more uh, human rights enforcing interpretations, but I think it's actually quite a tricky business. Uh, South Africa, for example, I mentioned earlier, does this with reference to its uh, customary laws, which are now recognized under the new South African constitution. So you have to actually acknowledge customary laws, but the provision is that it has to operate within the boundaries of the constitution. And then the complex issues occur when there's a dispute within the community about which tradition, which kind of an Inter an interpretation of a tradition should prevail. One which is referred to as the living tree, which is a more progressive kind of interpretation or the more traditional, traditional interpretation, which the court, at least in South Africa, has ruled in favor of the living tree, which is the more progressive interpretation. So you can see it as a great victory. There's also a deep concern for backlash because then it's not necessarily just an internal kind of a discussion. So talk about, we can talk about that later on. So these are two kinds of internal or internal plus external solutions. The regulated interaction solutions really uh, try and do two things. You can think about them as operating on two different spheres. One really would be to try and identify within each uh, kind of a dispute, the, like the intersecting disputes that I've mentioned to you earlier, just to try and see what's the most salient issue which the parties are seeking to find. If it doesn't overlap absolutely, then you can think about this as a Venn diagram. So some issues really might be the state, some might be the religions, some might be intersecting, and, and you could really limit the, the debate in the first place. And secondly, you could actually find resolutions, and I'm happy to give you 
lots of examples about how this is actually done in practice. Many disputes which seem absolutely to be uh, ir irreconcilable. If you actually do this breakdown work from the harm up, very context specific, what are the kinds of uh, disputes? If you really try and map it out, you'll find that in many cases there are more opportunities for finding solutions which are win-win kinds of solutions. Again, I don't want to oversell it, but there is that possibility. And in fact, if any of you are familiar with even just with an example which has nothing to do with religion, just international schools, say, in this city, for example, really follow this model of intersecting uh, Venn diagrams. That is, um, when we were here in New York, our son went to the British school. His curriculum was fully governed by an institution which sits in England. But everything else about that school was governed by New York state law and city law as it should be. That is the question of immunization, safety, a lack of abuse, reporting of abuse. All of these things were done here locally. So that's one kind of a question of how do you define which uh, institution or which entity has the authority. That's precisely where the, the complexities are. But on the ground, we actually see this occurring all the time, various creative kinds of solutions. So that's just one concrete example. I'm happy to talk about family law, but just in the interest of time, I'll just tell you one second dimension of resolving these kinds of disputes. And here we can just turn to the good old public court system. That is, our courts have, have, have a real sophisticated way of dealing with very complex legal issues. And one of the things which uh, have been done, and this is actually coming most of it, say, from France, the Netherlands, uh, cases where traditional kinds of contractual and torts remedies have been used, say, to address the get problem, abuse of right in France. It's a very familiar uh, terminology that you could use, has been applied to the kind of harm that a woman who's not divorced by her husband, if she wishes to do so, can turn to. Uh, in Canada, we've seen contractual mechanism. You can just say that there's a breach of a, the civil side of a contract has been breached. The court will never do what the courts in New York actually do, which is specific performance. The court, at least in Canada, would never enforce a religious party to take a religious obligation. But you can say that the breach of that obligation has civil ramifications, which we have various ways of addressing. So I want to suggest to you that if we uh, if we're willing to let go of the notion that we have to choose either one value or just one winner and one loser and actually begin to think more creatively, institutionally, to reflect the real dilemmas that women experience because they are already affected by these intersecting or overlapping systems, then I think there's a much, much greater room uh, for creativity and also for finding solutions to what appear to be problems that are just uh, irreconcilable. And I'll just uh, close with the notion of entangled. That is, although our intuition is to suggest that the best solution is to separate the sphere. That's the traditional secularist response. I want to suggest that the notion of disentanglement might work for certain kinds of discussions or debates or, or circumstances, but it's not always automatically the only solution that we should consider. There are cases where precisely the recognition of the entanglement, what I've referred to as these Venn diagrams, is precisely what we need to do. And that might actually permit greater freedom and greater protection of rights uh, to those who really need that kind of protection. And no doubt, there will be many, many kinds of uh, resistance or, or rejections of this kind of an approach. For sure, extremists within religious minority communities would see this as a corruption of the faith and the faithful. Uh, people who hold a very, very strong uh, notion of strict separation might also reject this kind of an idea which permits more entanglement than the traditional way of thinking about these issues. And it's clearly a delicate balance to achieve, but I want to suggest to you, despite the various obstacles, political will obstacles, various other obstacles that we will face, what I'm proposing, again, being the legal utopian here, is not a blueprint for any immediate kind of an implementation, and I'll just close with that. So I have no, idea, no uh, kind of uh, vision that uh, this will happen tomorrow morning, but if we don't explore the power of ideas, that is, if we don't uh, try and expand what is seen as the universe of the possible and rewrite the potential set of options, conceivable options for action, then change will never occur. So I want to suggest that even though I'm not expecting any of this to happen tomorrow morning, without any uh, thought about how change uh, or visions of change, change will never occur. So I'll close with that. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Carissa. Use the mic. Well, he's going to give it to you. Please say your name. Uh, my name is Carissa Velis I'm from uh, the Graduate Center from Philosophy. Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. I feel very uh, sympathetic to your approach. And one question I had, um, I agree that 
focusing on the individual, like these women you, you were mentioning that, that are part of minority groups and religious and mothers and et cetera, um, really shifts the, the view. And one question I have is whether there, there should be some hierarchy with these categories. Is it more important that they are first and foremost citizens or um, minorities or, or should these categories be completely equal and we should take an approach more like holistic approach to the individual? I mean, is this a solution or is it part of the problem of <laughs> being a uh, hi hierarchy? No, it's, it's a great question. Uh, um, I don't think you could have a predefined hierarchy, although uh, to some extent, um, the way in which we, once you work with international human rights and you're working with citizenship rights, in effect, you are working with a hierarchy, right? Because these are already predefined. Uh, but I think in this model, at least, you would definitely want to have the agents themselves participate in the definition of, of, of these uh, intersecting identities. But my assumption is, at least in, in rejecting the privatized diversity approach, I do want to suggest that it would be very artificial to just suggest that as a person who lives today in the 21st century that some of us could just say, but I'm really insulating myself to all of these effects of the law. Uh, and I might have very good reasons to do so, but even if this exemption could occur, it would have to be extremely narrow. So to some extent, I am assuming the, the overlapping kind of affiliation as, as a basic um, structure of this model, but it's more fluid. It's not, that's why it's not a hierarchy. And, and especially if you're thinking about this as Venn diagrams, you know, they could, they could move, they could shift, you might have to add another one. So I wouldn't take a strong hierarchy, but I would say that by definition, once you are working with existing norms, they themselves actually uh, shape your discussion to some extent. Sorry, Kisilevsky. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sari Kisilevsky from uh, Law and Philosophy, so I think my question's a bit of both. Uh, I wanted to pick up on your comment about drawing on, on family law, and I was wondering if you could generalize from the model of family law. So family law historically has been an area that was previously thought to be uh, private, right? The law had no, the courts had no business in it. And we've seen the law develop into an ex extremely nuanced and sensitive uh, set of rules, right? That govern, that kind of interact with ordinary family life in a way that tries to protect uh, all the parties, right? And, and we've, we've seen it grow so as to expand our notion of family also, right? In all kinds of interesting ways. So that, I would, I would have thought that would be a very good model for the kind of thing that you're talking about. That, that's what struck me when you were describing the problem. So no, definitely, I, I work a lot with family law, first of all, right. because some of the intersections, some of actually of the hardest questions do arise there. But I also agree with you that if you look at the history, it's actually a fascinating history uh, and one which uh, does permit you to definitely to see change over time. So even just to take the narrowest kind of a response would be to say, uh, for sure the changes have occurred there. And also, historically, this was more the realm of the, of the church than the state, right, if you look at Western uh, societies, at least. So, um, so this is... So in a way you're saying, why does the privatized diversity challenge even arise, if I understand you correctly? Oh yeah, for sure, no, I think that, again, I, I, I don't know if it would, you know, just to say it's a model is a bit strong, but it, it is one example among many. That is, I think that's why I brought in also the education example, and you can think about various other examples as well, where you do see um, a sense of of greater involvement, but I personally think that the family law example is a very powerful one, and precisely for the reasons that you have raised, uh, we know that there was a lot, you know, state laws historically were the ones that were uh, heavily discriminating against women. Women were not even recognized as legal entities under the coverture or tradition in, in British law and common law. So uh, it's not that this story is only happy, but for sure it required a good amount of feminist work and social mobilization and, and changes in the law to make this a more inclusive, and this is still partly a work in progress, for sure, in this country, right? Um, so so the question of, of whose rights are protected, who can even qualify as a member of a family, and what kind of rights and obligations apply between the parties and them towards third parties if children are involved. Yeah, I, I think I agree it's, it is a very good model. Uh, but I would just want to qualify that to some extent the reason why I'm saying it's not necessarily a real model is that each realm you would really want to look at it uh, and see what kinds of tensions and issues arise. But I think as a, um, as a working example, it's a wonderful one.
Okay, Nanette. Yeah, <clears throat> I want to, um, to uh, speak also about <coughs> the family law uh, issue and the example you give of how this regulated interaction can help that the, um, the court can, in a sense, um, the civil court can um, confirm that if the man has agreed to give a gift and that's in the, contra the divorce contract, then it's binding. But your example there, it was interesting because then they couldn't carry through with it in any way. So in the end, it didn't really help the woman um, when, when there was an attempt not to carry through with giving the git. <laughs> giving the git. <laughs> uh, but also, it was an example in which the woman's rights weren't at risk because the husband was agreeing uh, to give the git. So I'm wondering, how can this regulated interaction actually help when there's a real threat to the woman's right and that the husband won't, in some sense, cooperate? Would you say that the court, the civil court, can require that kind of uh, behavior, that, in this case, that the husband agrees to these, the religious divorce? We could talk about this for quite a while, so I'll give you the abbreviated version. It really depends on the circumstances. That is the case that I was referring to, actually, the Canadian case is, is a Supreme Court of Canada case called Markovitz versus uh, Bruker versus Markovitz. And that was a case where um, the divorce, the civil divorce agreement, was based on a prior contractual agreement between the parties. One of the provision was a provision of the husband turning to the Beth Dean and granting the wife a get. Uh, and that provision was introduced into the civil contract, into the contract which later on the civil divorce was based upon. That's the first step in this particular story. The second step uh, which happened was after the husband had the civil divorce, he said, true, I signed this contract, but this is just a moral obligation. It's not a legal obligation. And I'll just complicate the story a little bit more. This is a case that came from Quebec and Quebec the contract law in Quebec is subject to civil law, and civil law actually differentiates between a moral and a legal obligation. A moral obligation is one which you cannot enforce. So this became a serious issue. That is, if it's a moral, uh, if it's a moral obligation, it really cannot be enforceable, at least not uh, through the courts. So this came, this case again, like all the other ones I've told you, filtered around for quite a few years in the legal system. Um, the husband refused to grant the, the get for about ten years or so. Uh, and he was winning in the lower courts. Uh, but then for a host of reasons, which were no one is really clear how directly related they were to the legal proceeding, he decided to grant his wife the get. Um, so that issue was resolved by the time the case came before the Supreme Court of Canada. But the Supreme Court of Canada still had to make the call whether this was a moral or a legal obligation. And they said in this kind of a context, because it was so central for the wife agreeing to sign, and for the civil court in the first place, granting the civil divorce. The only way to really treat this particular individual, this woman, equally is to think about this as a civil st standard legal obligation in a contract. And the husband was ordered to pay quite significant remedies to the wife. Again, now not for the fact that he refused to get, because by that time he already granted it, but just because he breached a contract. And anyone who breaches a contract actually is subject to these kinds of remedies if they're sued. So the court was playing a very kind of a delicate game. They didn't want. They were fortunate. They didn't have to get to the question of specific performance because it was already executed in a way. The get was given, uh, but they were trying to suggest that they could do this kind of a separation, even if a, another case uh, came to the fore. And another way to think about this is just to legislate these kinds of relationship. That is, you could say that you would have a pre-requirement of turning to a religious authority. There are different mechanisms that different countries uh, have used, but I think the specific performance. The reason why I would want to try. Um, and rule it out is because that really requires a deep entanglement of the secular authority in, in an act which all in all the, the status component per se for Jewish law for example really would be more of a religious realm per se not a state unless you're in Israel right but if you're talking about uh, countries which have this strict separation then you would want to maintain some degree of autonomy so to speak of the state from the religion and the religion from the state so the question of what's overlapping and what is not to some extent is the hardest question in all of these models that's why I said also earlier on family law is a great example but in other spheres you might have a different set of interactions Fred, we only have time for one more in the back, yeah. Hi, Abby Ruane, um, Hunter College. 
I really enjoyed your concept of entanglement and disentanglement, and I was wondering if you had looked at some of the work from peace studies, um, feminist peace studies like Galtung, Katya Confortini do some, does some work in that area, and conflict transformation that talks about um, connecting issues as a way for creative change. I feel like it resonates a lot with what you've talked about. Um, and in that regard, going back to a question earlier um, on Sheila Ben Habib's talk about the recognizing power in discourse, I was wondering if those kinds of discussions with feminist peace studies and tra uh, conflict transformation might be an opportunity to link both of your talks and dealing with how uh, to navigate power issues in discourse. I was just wondering what you thought about that. Do you want me to? You, um, I'm not sufficiently familiar with that literature, but the, the conflict transformation I am familiar with, and you're right, it is partly the same kind of a logic of trying to take a, a very, uh, uh, in certain cases, very violent uh, kinds of uh, disagreements or indeed deep violence and trying to transform it into some kind of a new form of engagement. Uh, so I think power inevitably plays a very central role. You, first of all, there, there's, you need to get to a, a position where the different parties are willing to even engage peacefully, right? That's a very uh, significant moment to begin with. And then once you have that, the question of how to transform the conflict is a significant one. But I would just want to um, suggest that at least in these kinds of examples that we have discussed today, and, and you're right that we could expand it to the transnational realm as well, uh, you, the procedural requirement which you probably would want to insist upon as a matter of, of just ensuring representation uh, is to say that you want to have for sure within each uh, represented community, if this is a kind of negotiated settlement, you would want to have representatives of sub-communities of a given community. So for example, uh, if you're thinking about indigenous communities and you're thinking about the question of women within those indigenous communities, they have very specific interests which sometimes are well represented by uh, their male leaders and sometimes are not. Uh, so you would want to ensure, for example, that you had a contingency of, say, female indigenous members of whatever uh, negotiating uh, party. You would want to perhaps even break it down more specifically if you know there's something about the potential vulnerability or indeed the, the kind of past harms. So I would want the most harmed party to definitely be there and speak uh, as directly as possible, even if there is a form of representation, it's not going to be direct democracy necessarily, but if you, you want to at least have agents who can speak on behalf of a contingency uh, that you can predictably expect, uh, either based on historical experience or just based on the kind of power relations, that that contingency would be the one that has a real stake, a deep stake in these kinds of resolutions and just the assumption that someone else could speak on their behalf. I would be very worry, worried about it and weary of accepting it. Um, okay, well, both of our distinguished speakers have agreed to come in to our reception where you can talk to them personally. We'll be on the fifth floor. Please join me in thanking Ayala. Very stimulating, and also Shayla. Thank you both. <laughs>